Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Battlefield, Pennsylvania. Today we're filming on location at the Erie Maritime Museum. In the year 1812, the United States declared war on an old enemy, the Empire of Great Britain. Controversial in its own time, many viewed the War of 1812 as a matter of mere politics, while others as an issue of national security. Two centuries later, the confusion remains, but there is one irrefutable bright spot. In 1813, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry oversaw the construction of a fleet that eventually do battle and defeat the mighty British Navy. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Joining me today is Walter Ribka, director of the Erie Maritime Museum and senior captain of the U.S. Brig Niagara. Walter, thank you for being here. Quite welcome. Tell us about this wonderful facility, the Erie Maritime Museum. Oh, well, the Maritime Museum opened in uh, 1998. It was um, uh, for two, it's the circumstances that the Penelec uh, Front Street Generating Station was uh, uh, was de uh, decommissioned in '92, and Penelec decided to give the land to uh, the PHMC and the county, and it worked out that uh, actually PHMC didn't take ownership, we have uh, the equivalent, we have a lease that's 99 years for a dollar renewable, but it's actually a county building, Erie County, the library is next door, a new library was built. And um, we have a common lobby and we opened in 1998. And our primary exhibit here is about the building of the squadron for the War of 1812. The Maritime Museum tries to cover the later maritime history since, the 200 years that happened afterwards. We have some small exhibits on fishing. And as we're collecting things and get more material over the years, we'll fill that in about the growth of the um, aids to navigation, that whole structure of infrastructure and government uh, supplied aids to navigation that helped the, the um, ships navigate all around the lakes, life-saving stations. Um, quite a few stories to tell that we haven't got to yet, but we have a pretty good coverage on the War of 1812. Now you're a senior captain of the U.S. Brig Niagara. Could you talk a little bit about how you came to that position? Um, yeah, so I, I've always worked in, uh, in traditional sailing ships that were either replicas or restorations for educational purposes um, or museum ships. I uh, uh, started at South Street Seaport Museum, sailed on the schooner Pioneer for a number of years. I worked on the restoration of the Alyssa for the Galveston Historical Foundation. She was an iron merchant ship, 1877. Um, and then she sailed for a number of years. Actually, she still sails on a limited basis. And um, I, was, I was recruited to come here in 1991 to see if it was feasible to do a regular sailing program, training some volunteers and having a small professional crew and we just work out a program to utilize the ship and take her to some ports. And it was a six month contract and Fire! got extended for a year and then uh, well, I'm still here, but it turned out to be a pretty good fit. So I, I came to this business through being a, a seaman with an interest in history and I, I don't have academic credentials as a historian. I, um, but to tell the story, we had to learn a lot about it and uh, do all the reading of material, all the research, and and uh, so I participated in a great deal of the the research and the design of the exhibit in this museum uh, because it's such an interweaving in the technology of the ship with the uh, with the historical story. So I came into it through being a captain rather than a museum administrator. Lake Erie, in a lot of ways, straddles two worlds simultaneously: American and Canadian. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about why this lake was so important in the year 1812? Well, you see, the lake was the only way, well, to this day, the most efficient way to move anything heavy is float it. And in 1813, that was really even more so because the roads were, they were either non-existent or, or pretty muddy a lot of the year. You had to wait for good weather ashore, just like at sea. You might be windbound waiting for decent wind in the right direction or a storm to die down before you could sail on the lake. But on the land, you had to wait for good weather to have a dry enough road where your axles would sink in, your, your wheels just sink in right up to the axle. And so land travel was very difficult, very slow, very inefficient. You had to worry about where there was enough forage for the horses. 
Um, and then in a lot of the, the areas around here, which are heavily wooded, uh, that would be an issue. And then also, um, as you went further towards the western end of the lake, you were so subject to interdiction by the, uh, by the Indians, who were generally more supportive of the British as being the lesser of two evils in terms of who was most likely to take their lands and evict them from it. There was a long history at that point of the Americans doing so. And so um, a lot of the tribes were attempting to just stay neutral or stay out of this and keep their heads down and, and avoid the trouble if they could. But uh, those that did take up arms, um, more of them did so on behalf of the British. And so for the Americans, it was very vital to, uh, to be able to, to move by lake. And um, it was the only efficient way to move men and supplies. What was the relationship between the United States and Canada in the year 1812? Well, Canada really barely existed and that it was so sparsely settled, the population was so small. It was called the Canadas. You know, it wasn't considered one country. It was a series of separate colonies. You know, Newfoundland and, and uh, Nova Scotia were separately administered. The Quebec had been taken over after the French Indian War. Upper uh, uh, Ontario was the, that was the far west and very sparsely settled. And so, and the relationship was not a bad one at all, uh, as such as it went. We had a great many people who moved into Canada because land was a little cheaper there, and they were American-born. And they ended up in a very bad place in that uh, we didn't trust them after they crossed over because they left the country and went and took up residence in another country, and the British didn't trust them because they came from America. Uh, they came from the States, and most of them simply wanted to um, buy a farm at affordable prices and work it and stay the hell out of everybody's way. And so it was very apolitical. I'd say probably these people were caught on the, on the, on the shifting tectonic plates of empire. They got caught on the edge. That's how they got sucked into the fight. If you visit Erie today, it's still very much a maritime city. What was it like in 1812? Well, 1812, it, it wouldn't qualify as a city. <laughs> Maybe a, a, a frontier town, about 500 people. Um, when the building crew came here for the building of the American squadron here, they had, to build log, they had to build log cabins. They had to build log buildings to house the crews to, uh, to work through the winter and get the ships done. And so it was a very small frontier community. In 1812, you're very much living in a world of superpowers, but America wasn't one of those superpowers, was it? Uh, no, America did not register as, as a power period. It uh, was so small and so, um, uh, you know, the population at the time was, I don't recall, but it was, I think it was under 10 million maybe seven, eight, uh, you'd have better knowledge of that than I would, but, and it's still mostly, mostly on the East Coast. And then you have this very thin line of settlement that goes over the Appalachians and, the, and down the Ohio River and, and follows the waterways. And, you know, Cleveland is 50 houses. Erie is 500 people. Um, uh, you know, that size towns and smaller. And so it's, um, yeah, we're, we're not a power at all. We have, uh, we had a tiny navy that we had built up to fight the Barbary pirates, fight the North African states. Uh, but after that war in 1807, the fleet was largely disbanded and laid up and people put on um, um, furlough and, uh, and the army was minuscule. It was under 5,000, mostly on the western frontiers to try to defend settlement against uh, um, Indians defending their land. And uh, so the, uh, the country was not prepared at all for war. And uh, it, um, it's really amazing that the, the people who 
consistently voted against any taxes to pay for a strong military, where by and large people voted for the war. I don't know what they were thinking, but, <laughs> but they did. Uh, On that note, who were the superpowers and what were they doing? Well, the, the two dominant powers were Great Britain and France, and they were at each other's throats continuously since about 1792. Historically, many years of, of war had interspersed with periods of dormancy, let's say. But um, from 1792, when the French Revolution, uh, when the um, neighboring states decided to have a crack at quashing the French Revolution, and then the French proved that they could defend themselves and then, and then went on the rampage against the rest of Europe, basically. Um, from 1792, except for the Peace Amiens little intermission about 1803, there was like uh, just continuous warfare until uh, 1815. The British are, as you said, at continuous war with France. What was impressment? Why was it such a big deal? Impressment was like uh, conscription into the Navy. It was, um, it's, it's very ironic that the people who, Britain was the freest country in Europe by a long shot. Uh, I've often said the only reason the American Revolution had a prayer succeeding is because we were already the freest people in the world. Uh, we, had a, we were under a legal system that made it relatively hard to put people in jail. And so Washington, Jefferson, all those people never would have been heard from if we were anybody else's colony. We would have been locked up and throw away the key the first time they made any noise. The reason we got away with it was because this was a country that uh, had a free press, had, uh, had a tremendous amount of freedom. And, but in Britain, they said the Navy is absolutely essential. They could have a volunteer army, only country in Europe that had a volunteer army. But, um, but the Navy, they, they needed it. And they wanted volunteers for the Navy and sometimes got them, but they were always short compared to the number of people they really needed. And so impressment said they could seize people for involuntary service in the Navy. And only English citizens were subject to this, theoretically. But um, British sailors are starting to desert as the war is getting, there's just no end to it. They're not getting home. You know, in, in the wars of the mid 18th century, maybe you get impressed off your fishing vessel, or merchant vessel, and you're in the Navy now, and you put up with it and you survive, and, and maybe two, three later you get home, two, three years later. But at this war, they got in this vicious cycle where they weren't granting shore leave because people would desert because they weren't seeing their, their homes and never saw their relatives again. And so as they're keeping them on the ships, it's getting worse and worse. It's this vicious cycle. And so people are deserting. They're having a lot of desertion. And the most popular place to desert is onto an American ship in some foreign port. If both ships are in port, you would then uh, sign on the American vessel, which spoke the same language, offered ready employment, generally at a higher wage, and we're not at war. So they're hemorrhaging people into American ships. And so they start stopping American ships they're stopping every ship they run across, you know, Swedish, French, Dutch, British, you know, whatever, and looking for British seamen. But uh, on an American ship, now how do you tell the difference? Uh, who's who? No fingerprints, no passports. And so a lot of Americans got forced into service in the Royal Navy. It was only intended for trying to recount, recapture their own, but uh, it had a, uh, a far bigger net than that. And, um, and that, that was a really, uh, let's say, egregious violation of rights, even by British standards. But uh, actually, particularly by British standards, it was uh, the country that, that was the freest in Europe, and yet they would disappear their own people off the streets and force them into the ships. Now, the British always claimed to rule the seas. We know that. Yeah. How did that translate to the Great Lakes? Well, um, it went as far as salt water went, but it didn't go as far as fresh water picked up. Uh, the, the reason the Americans had a prayer of surviving the War of 1812 was because the might of the Royal Navy could not easily penetrate the continent beyond Montreal. 
Montreal was built where it was because it's the head of navigation. That's as far as you can get an ocean-going ship on the St. Lawrence before the seaway was built. And so, but beyond Montreal lay the Lachine Rapids, this tremendous expanse of tumbling water, broken water over rock. Every mile west from there, you had to carry things, portage to get to water where you could put them in canoes or small vessels. And then there was another set of rapids at Cornwall before you could get up the river to Kingston. So ships for Lake Ontario had to be built there. And then with Niagara Falls separating Lake Erie from Lake Ontario, ships for Lake Erie had to be built there. And so both sides got off to a fairly even start um, because the, the might of the Royal Navy could simply not be extended sailing up into the Great Lakes. The War of 1812 is considered one of the more confusing wars in American history. Mm -hmm. Could you take us through the events that colluded to bring us to that point? Uh, well, um, it'd take a little while, but I'd say the, the primary causes of that war were, impressment was one of them, but that would not have done it on its own because so many people who felt, well, okay, if you wanna go sail in a war zone, you take your chances. There's plenty of things to do domestically. Um, the restrictions on trade were, Britain passed laws that would basically prohibit trade with the continent because that was, as far as they were concerned, enemy held. And Napoleon had, had about the same set of laws. It's just that the French Navy didn't have the power to enforce them as much. But American ships were occasionally seized by the French. American ships would be seized by the British if they had a cargo bound for a European port, for a French port. And, uh, um, but merchants were still making money. The demand for freight was such, the demand for goods was such, that the freights were so high that on the ships that got through, you made up for the ones you lost. Um, but still, the, the frustration over the seizures and over the stoppages of trade and the economic hardship that imposed, that was probably very compelling. And, the, um, and then also the people in the West felt that as long as you had a British presence in North America, they would be encouraging the Indians to resist westward expansion. Now, the British did not want a war. They, they stopped short of in, inciting tribes to attack. But their policy very clearly was to um, help the Indians maintain a level of independence as a buffer because the growth of the United States was not desirable to Great Britain because... Um, well, they'd never know what side we'd be on in a future war. Maybe we'd ally with France against them. I mean, the fact that there was a level of amity or reasonable amity after the revolution, that's always amazed me how quick they got over that. Because the American Revolution was not only a, uh, from their point, this is a tax revolt that got out of hand, and then you people betray your country by going to help for the French, your traditional enemy. And you would not live a day under the, under the French king, but you embrace his help. And that was looked at as the, sort of the ultimate treason to go enlist French help for the, uh, for the revolution. And so if this, if this unknown country of uh, primarily apolitical, get-rich-quick schemers uh, you never knew which way they'd turn, so if they didn't grow very big and strong, that was all right, as far as they were concerned. Um, so moving, getting, getting the British out of here would be the key to getting the Indians out. And so there was a lot of sentiment for that. So it was, it was a cumulative frustration that I think led to the declaration of war. There's no precipitating event. Uh, there's no one cause. And it's a deeply divided Congress that does it. It's 40% dissenting votes in both houses. And that's not so much over um, that any sympathy for Britain's position. It was, guys, we're not ready to do this. What are you thinking? Uh, and actually, they, I don't think nowadays we'd call it intelligence failure. Because at that time, they didn't, they didn't know what they were up against, literally. I don't think they quite realized, they knew Britain was big, they knew it was powerful, but I don't think they quite realized how so, the, how big the disparity was. We declared war on a power whose armed forces outnumbered our own by roughly 24 to 1. <laughs> uh, 
but you know, there's no Office of Naval Intelligence, no CIA, no satellite surveillance. How are they going to know this? Now, the Americans have very little presence on the Great Lakes from yes. any military capacity. The British do. Could you talk about who they are and what they're doing? Well, they have a provincial marine, which was a transport service for the army. It had a few armed ships. They had a head start that way. And they had some, and we had frontier forts that we were garrisoning. And they had a few forts in the area that, um, but very, very weakly manned, very thinly held. The British basically did not think they could hold on to Canada. And they were very pleasantly surprised when they discovered the incompetence of their attackers. Gave them a prayer hanging on to it. Who was Daniel Dobbins? Uh, Daniel Dobbins was a Erie shipmaster. He came here as a, as a land surveyor and then started getting into business ventures which required trading and moving around the lake. And pretty soon he realized the only way to get around here is, is by water. And so he eventually learned to uh, sail, became a seaman and then was owner and master of his own merchant vessel, a schooner that primarily dealt in salt, which was a very important commodity then because uh, it was necessary for preserving food. And so everybody had to have salt. If you were gonna, uh, just that was, that was an essential life. And areas that had salt mines were always gonna be at a ready market to uh, transport the stuff anywhere else. So Dominus was a, um, uh, a man who was pretty well respected, well known, coming up in the trade and, and uh, becoming a, a relatively well-to-do merchant and shipmaster. And he knew the geography of the lakes probably better than anybody at the time. He was at Mackinac when it was captured and then at Detroit. And then he brought the news in person to the cabinet in Washington of the disaster of of how badly Hull's invasion had turned out and that the whole U.S. Northwest frontier was was under dire threat. And he, I think, persuaded them or was able with his first-hand knowledge of the area to, to show them that what you really need to do is you got to build a squadron right away and Erie is the place to do it. Why do you think he was so keen on Erie and Presque Isle Bay being the place? Um, partially because it really is the only good harbor that's here. It was a good sheltered port. It was accessible to the level of industry we had and a short supply line to, to uh, Pittsburgh. And also it was his home. So he would naturally have, uh, let's say, a bias in that. But in this case, I think it was also just on reasonable reflection, it was the best place too. Now, Dobbins had a big plan. Isaac Chauncey is a big part of that story though. Who is he and why is he important? Well, Isaac Chauncey is a U.S. Navy captain who gets appointed as the commander of the lake, um, the, the Great Lakes Theater of Operations. He's the area commander, so he's building on Lake Ontario. He had been commandant in the New York Navy Yard before the war. He gets moved up to Lake Ontario, and that's the real strategic key, because whoever controls Ontario, if you can capture the British town of Kingston and Toronto, you cut off all supplies moving west from there, everything to the west of that falls. And at the same time, if the British could capture uh, Chauncey's fleet, then he'd have lost the war in an afternoon for us. And so the main effort is, is, uh, is on Lake Ontario. Bigger squadrons are built, bigger ships, more of them. Uh, Lake Erie's a sideshow. But um, you don't hear much about Lake Ontario because the battles there, were, there was never a decisive battle. Well, the, they would engage, and if somebody's getting the worst of it, they'd pull back because both commanders are more con more concerned about sort of being a, on defensive guard of their position. What were they instructed to build here in Presque Isle Bay? Um, well, for starters, they were building a few gunboats, four gunboats, which is sort of a generic term for any small vessel that only had a couple of guns on it uh, because uh, the... The area was not well charted at all. They had no idea of uh, the hazards in a lot of the area, except you know, it was extensive. There were a lot of rocks and shoals. So they wanted small vessels that not so much would be at risk and they could pass over a lot of shoals. But they also decided they needed more firepower. And there were also two, there was, there was also two efforts going on. At first, Chauncey detailed Jesse Duncan Elliott to go to Black Rock 
which is on the Niagara River, just north of Buffalo, and establish a naval station there and to buy up whatever merchant vessels were available, several schooners, and convert them to, to warships by putting guns on them and strengthening their decks and bulwarks a little bit. And so that conversion work was going on at, uh, at Buffalo, basically, uh, just north of. And, and then Chauncey also left orders for starting to cut timber sufficient to build a brig that would carry 20 guns. But he came to visit here in Niagara on January 1st of 1813, was persuaded this was the better building site, and directed Dobbins to um, keep going on the gunboats. They considered two of them too small, and they were lengthened 10 feet. And so they became the four schooners that were built here. Um, but he also then subsequently in February he wrote a contract letter to a New York shipbuilder, uh, Noah Brown, that was a, um, like a performance spec. It said, I want you to go to Erie and build in the least possible time two brigs that will carry 20 guns of 32-pound carronades, and I want them on the shallowest draft that can carry these guns. And uh, the, the frame, which dictates the shape of the ship, the frame, etc., I'll leave entirely up to you. So it wasn't a design spec, it was a performance spec. And that was the basis of the Lawrence and the Niagara. And so out of Perry, Perry initially started out with like 11 ships because he had um, one of them, the Amelia, was leaking so badly, he left her in Erie. And then one, the Schooner Ohio, was used as a supply ship running back and forth. That was actually Dobbins' command. And so he was not present at the battle because he'd been sent off to resupply. That was in Erie and then showed up and put in bay a few days later. But Perry had 10 ships, six of which had been built in, in Erie, the four schooners, the two brigs, and then four were converted merchant vessels that he sailed here from uh, Black Rock from the Niagara River in June. And that was his squadron 10. You mentioned Oliver Hazard Perry. His name looms large over all of this. Uh, who was he and why was he selected for this? Um, well, he was a young naval officer. He was pretty ambitious. He'd been in the Navy since he was 13. He had uh, been a midshipman in the Barbary Wars and, um, and then had uh, gotten a command of a schooner, the Revenge, which was lost on a reef due to navigational error. The civilian pilot, pilot was apportioned most of the blame for that, and so Perry was able to keep his commission. But in the U.S. Navy, any time you lose a ship for any reason other than having a shot out from under you, it's, it's not a good career move. And so in, when the war came in 1813, he was in charge of a squadron of gunboats in Newport, which is where he was from. Uh, not likely to see much action. He petitioned for a saltwater command. We had so few ships, we were probably going to more senior people anyway. But the fact that uh, the loss of revenge might have been held against him somewhat. But uh, he, he applied for joining Chauncey on the Lakes, figuring that, well, you know, that's going to be... Nobody's going to go, going to want to go to the lakes because there's very little prospect of prize money. We're probably not going to be able to capture merchant ships. Or there aren't any. There's, uh, but So if nobody wants to go there, then it'll probably be fairly easy to get a command there. So we applied to Chauncey, wrote him a letter in November, and about January, Chauncey writes back, and, and he'd written the Secretary of the Navy and, and asked him to send Perry up there because he said uh, he recognized that Perry had some ability and... He had supervised the construction of his gunboat squadron, so he had a little bit of that interface of shipyard uh, grasp on logistics and what it takes to get things built. And uh, so when he got up to Lake Ontario, he just sent him on to Lake Erie and said, this is, you're the man I want for this job. And I think it's because he was um, ambitious, he volunteered for it, but uh, it was also not a very desirable position because it's out in this wilderness backwater. Um, yeah, you know, they're they're waiting. There's constant fear of Indian attack, um, constant fear of a British surprise attack. The British are in no position to do so, but we don't know that. Um, and so it was uh, not a very popular place to be, and, and it was a hardship post. It was a hard, cold winter, and they had trouble getting supplies, getting food, getting everything, and uh, it was a pretty difficult effort for him to to work out here. 
Now, to build a fleet the size that Perro is looking at, you would need a large amount of raw materials. Were those all available locally? Well, the wood was instantly available in unlimited quantity at that time. I mean, this country had a riches of forests that people coming from Europe could not believe. They'd been felling and, and competing, having competing uses for their forests for a long time. But over here, it was just virgin timber that it was said a squirrel could go from the east coast of Mississippi without hitting ground if he didn't want to. Um, so, and the timber selection was, um, you know, the Niagara was built in such a hurry in the Lawrence, it was emergency wartime construction, we needed it yesterday. And so the selection of timber was the closest tree to the work site, and the one behind that, and the one behind that, and the one behind that. And uh, so wood was unlimited availability. But the everything else, though, that was difficult. Uh, iron for fastenings. Dobbins was riding around every place trying to buy up barn hinges and buy up anything he could that could be pounded into a fastening. And they went as far as Belmont, which is middle of Pennsylvania, like 200 miles from Erie, trying to buy iron. And uh, the um, anchors and the hemp rope were contracted from Pittsburgh. Shot was cast in Pittsburgh. The guns were either brought a few overland from Buffalo that had originally started in New York at the Navy Yard, and then a lot of them were cast in Georgetown outside of Washington, D.C., and brought up the uh, uh, canal system and the waterways there. So basically everything had to come from a long distance off except wood. A fleet this size needs a crew. Yes. Were they available in Erie? Where did they come no. from? No, the crew were... Uh, that was Perry's constant problem, and a constant refrain of his was complaining about lack of men. He, he had with him, he was sent men from, from Lake Ontario, little dribs and drabs. You know, they'd be sent with a, uh, a subordinate officer, and 20 or 30 men would come, and 40 men here and 10 here, and, and they'd gradually be sent to accumulate here, and he would assign them as best they could. Uh, to make use of their talents and shuffling them around from vessel to vessel. Uh, the crews primarily did the rigging work on the ship because that's what they know how to do as seamen. The builders were, Noah Brown had his civilian carpenters who were enticed to come here by twice the wage they would get in New York. And, uh, um, but, uh, uh, and they were unemployed in New York largely because of the British blockade, so that was a double incentive to come here. But he... Uh, he has a civilian building crew, and then Perry is still short on men. He's recruiting some local citizens, some people who are in the militia. He persuaded the militia commanders to let them transfer to, uh, to the Navy if they wish to. Um, he eventually applied to Harrison for, for similar help from the Army and got about 140 men out of the Army uh, after he had sailed west from here. But he, uh, he had maybe 340 men who were U.S. Navy out of his 530-something. Uh, so at least two-thirds of his men were Navy. Uh, Barclay had a position where only about a third of his men were Royal Navy, and the rest were either Army or volunteers or Canadian Provincial Marine or various sources. And so Perry was short-handed, but not as, not, as badly as, not as bad as Barclay was. You mentioned Barclay. Could you... Explain who he is. Oh, Barclay was the British, his counterpart. Uh, same rank, same age, 28. Uh, he was assigned to Lake on Erie by Yo, the commander on Lake Ontario. And, and Barclay only got, he kind of got stuck with the job because everybody senior to him had turned it down because it looked to be too forlorn a hope. Um, uh, small resource base, not enough men. But somebody had to do it, so Barclay got sent. And uh, he was the British commander. And as I said, he had a smaller proportion of his men Royal Navy. So it's very, it's almost a, um, it's just an exaggeration to say that Perry defeated the British Navy. He, he defeated a, a very small remnant or a very small outpost of the British Navy uh, that was stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and they put up a hell of a fight, too. Now, if you visualize Lake Erie, on the western end, you have a large target. Barclays there. What is that target? Why is it important? Well, um, the British had, had captured Detroit 
at the beginning of the war. They also captured the fort up in Mackinac. They'd also taken Fort Dearborn, which is now Chicago. So the whole Northwest had fallen under British and Indian control. And we thought this would be a springboard for an invasion into Ontario, and it, was, uh, it turned out disastrously for us. And uh, so they, they had um, captured Detroit. And so they were in a position to threaten Ohio. And, uh, but they really weren't in a position to, to really invade uh, in any strength. They didn't have the manpower to do it. They were just intent on hanging on to what they had. But it would have included Detroit. It would have included Michigan. And so to get that back, we had tried to uh, send an army in January. Uh, when the ground was frozen and you could uh, march pretty well. And they had been defeated at, Raisin, at the, the River Raisin, now, it's now Monroe, Michigan. And that was a pretty disastrous setback for us. And after that defeat, we decided, the Secretary of War decided we're, gonna, we're not going to attempt anymore to recapture Detroit until we have command of the lake. So we can move troops without worrying about them, get shot out of the woods by the Indians, we can get supplies moved by water, and we have control of the lake that we can see about landing, an amphibious landing, and, and taking back Detroit. And so that was the strategic goal, was to recapture Detroit. And it involved um, getting command of the lake, defeating the, whatever British ships were there, so that you could move men and supplies yourself and deny them the ability to do so. Oliver Hazard Perry has ships, he has men. What's his objective? Well, his objective is to, to go seek out and capture, destroy the British squadron. And he's ready to do so by August. And he sails down to put in bay, use that as his base of operations, which is a good anchorage. And he sailed out of there a lot. He sailed out for two, three days at a time to go reconnoiter up around Detroit. He didn't sail up the river because he had no charts of it, a lot of shoals. The British had gun emplacements on the land. It was just a bad business to get in there, but he kept an eye on what they were doing. And uh, they're basically blockaded in because he has a stronger squadron now until they had the Detroit built completed. They were building a ship, which was largest, the largest one on the lake. And when they had that completed, that, that's when Barclay decided he could come out to fight and actually didn't have much choice because by then they're running out of provisions. Um, when Barclay came out to fight, it was not with any sense of, um, of hubris. It was not with any sense of impending victory. He comes out with a squadron that's been on half rations for a week, and they have half rations for one more week, and then they're out. And so it was, um, you know, ready or not, we've got to do this. Let's get it over with. In your book, you describe the Battle of Lake Erie as the hungry fighting the sick. Yes, because Perry had a lot of problem in his squadron with uh, fever and dysentery. And we don't know whether, there's some thought that might have been malarial mosquitoes on Lake Erie at that time, might have been the malaria, but uh, also might have been just, um, the dysentery might have been contamination of the water from, um, basically their sewage was going into the same water they were fishing on buckets to drink from. See, the, 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 the lakes were on, on salt water, they had to carry their water on ships very tightly rationed. Here in the lakes, it was just unlimited supplies of, of fresh water overside, but probably were subject to some level of contamination as well. And they had no knowledge of bacteria. And um, so we had as many as a third of the squadron on the sick list at any time. People were gradually getting acclimated to it and developing some immunity because the sick list was only about maybe 15, 20% of the men by the, by the day before the battle. But still, you know, you know how great you felt after you've had the flu when you get back to work. These guys would be trashed for a week or 10 days with fever, and they'd stagger up and work for a week or two, and then maybe cycle around again. And so pretty, pretty unhealthy, pretty unhappy gang that way. We have Oliver Hazard Perry's American squadron moving toward Barclay's British squadron. Take us through the Battle of Lake Erie. Well, actually, it started sort of the night before when Barclay, hoping to get into the islands and maybe catch Perry at dawn at anchor, where he could maybe swarm on board and board. Because Barclay had a lot of soldiers. He had more men than Perry. And so he was hoping to maybe carry a boarding action. 
but the wind was so light he didn't get there. He sailed overnight but only covered about half the 30 miles from Detroit. His ships are about 10 miles off when they're sighted at dawn. Now Perry's got to get out of the anchorage at Puddin Bay and with the wind direction at that time Barclay could sail across it. It was like 90 degrees to him coming on the side. He could sail a course and maintain a straight heading. Maybe he's only doing two knots but that's something that's in the right direction. Perry can't, he can't sail out directly into the wind. He has to tack back and forth crisscrossing and his ships are blocking each other's wind, they're blocking each other's way. It's taken four hours for him to get out of the harbor and he's not out yet. And he sees that Barclay's getting closer. It's four hours, even at two knots, four hours is gonna be eight miles. He's maybe 10 miles away, he's gonna be at two miles now. Uh, it's like another half hour, he's gonna be within a mile, he's gonna be in range. I have to do something. So Perry decides that he will fight them that day even if he has to accept the lee gauge, the downwind position but he's got to get in a line somehow. And he gives the order to go downwind of Snake Island, the outermost part of the harbor. And that would have been a tight spot because he's kind of hard up against the land and doesn't have much room to maneuver. And, um, but he's lucky, very lucky because the wind dies just then, poof, gone completely. Ships just sit, sails flap. Five, 10 minutes later, it comes back. Comes back from 90 degrees different from the southeast. Now he's got the wind behind him. We'll shove him out of the harbor right over to the British. Barclay has the wind in his face. He has to fall off on one tack or the other. He chooses to go off on the port tack heading west because he has about 30 miles before he runs out of room that way. And so now it becomes sort of an overtaking situation because even though Barclay, he wants to get this over with, uh, but his ships are going to form a compact line. And in order to have any steering control at all, you have to have some water moving past the rudder. So he's maneuvering his ships to sail slowly, but they've got to do about a knot. And so they're doing about a knot away from him. Perry's overtaking maybe a two or three. So the net difference is maybe about two. Uh, I have a three knot breeze. Perry ships maybe doing three knots. Barclay's doing one away, so it takes about two hours to close the range. And in this long stern chase, that's called from a stern, he's, he's trying to catch up and overhaul Barclay's line. Um, Perry's got a problem because there's so, such different sailing abilities among his ships. A couple of the schooners were built to be fast ships. They were built with sharp hulls, proportionate to big rigs. Uh, they were pretty quick. but. Others were converted merchant vessels, emphasizing carrying capacity, cargo uh, capacity. They're heavy hulls. They're not. They're pretty bluff. They're not fast ships. And on a light air day like this, with light wind, mm -hmm. summer day, uh, very often the wind aloft is much much stronger than the wind at the, at the surface level. So the the Niagara and the Lawrence, they have these tall rigs, and they can catch a fair amount of wind in the upper sails. But the small vessels, which may be only 50, 60 feet off the water, they've got much less wind. And so the practical effect is that Perry's line is getting horribly strung out. Four of his vessels that have very heavy guns on them, because there's so little room on these gunboats, they're going to carry one gun, that's all we've got room for. Let's make it as, as heavy as we can carry, just physically on the ship. So Perry has some 24-pound long guns. He has 32-pound long guns, which are more powerful than any gun the British have. But he's got them on vessels that are more than two miles astern. They're out of range. They haven't closed up. And so when he gets within range, the Detroit has a lot of long guns, which are mixed calibers, but 18, 24 pound. And so initially, even though on a squadron basis, uh, he's not outgunned, right in this, in this where it counts, ship to ship, with these two ships closing in, uh, the British have a temporary advantage here. And Perry realizes that with the, the way these ships are converging slowly, that it's going to take too long. He's going to get really shot up. And so he has, he has to make a choice. He has two choices. He can either, and, and what most commanders would have done, almost certainly what Chauncey would have done, is would have hauled to windward, 
open the range out and would have uh, maybe tacked back, turned around, sailed back to the gunboats, maybe passed him a tow line, tried to consolidate his strength so he could concentrate his firepower later in the day. Um, the other choice he takes is a very, very risky one, and that's to make a downwind right turn and to sail right at him. He's got the wind behind him. If I turn bows on and run in here, he's subjecting himself to raking fire where they can fire down the length of his deck and he can't shoot back. But the idea is that if I can just close, if I can not get hit too badly, if I can endure this for like 15, 20 minutes, we'll get into range where these short carronades, which throw 32 pound ball, but only out to half a mile. But if we can get down there close enough to use my carronades, then I've got them. I have such heavy firepower in the short range battery that, that we're gonna clobber them. And that's his thinking. And he proceeds to order that turn. And the two small fast schooners, the Ariel and the Scorpion, go in with them. The Brig Caledonia, which is fairly slow, but uh, she goes with them and starts the downwind maneuver. And the Niagara does not. Niagara hangs back, and very deliberately so. He's, he's even backed his topsail to be, to you know, catch the wind and put the brakes on. And so Captain Niagara did not back him up. Now, why is this? Um, Jesse Duncan Elliott had been decorated for heroism in action before. It's not too likely. And somebody, you know, I don't think he lost his nerve. I think, I think he judged that Perry was making a catastrophic mistake. He wasn't about to fall into it. I think this was insubordination rather than cowardice. And it, um, so what happens is that Perry gets down there, he closes the range, and I believe the wind does die. And I think what Jesse Elliott is thinking is what happens, it's, it's, it's afternoon now, hot day, the wind is dying and he feels it's probably lessening and probably Elliot as a seaman would have recognized that and Perry too if he'd been thinking a little more uh, was that if this breeze it's probably going to die for a few hours in the early afternoon hottest part of the day and if I get down there and or if I get halfway in and the wind dies I'm still not in carronade range what's going to happen you can get shot to bloody splinters you can use the sweeps, the oars, but that's pretty slow, pretty cumbersome. Um, it's, you, you, that, that's a real risk Perry's taking, is that trying to advance on when the wind's dying at the same time. Now Perry gets there, he gets there in time before the wind dies, he gets into short range. He's able to fight the Detroit with carronades. So if Elliot had gone in and supported his commander I think the Niagara would have got there too, and the battle would have been over in half the time with half our losses. Because the Niagara and the Lawrence together had this massive firepower of carronades, 32 pound carronades. But as it is, the Niagara is hanging back at the extreme limit of long gun range, about a mile. And so his one 12 pounder, or his two 12 pounders, two 12 pound long guns, Elliot could say that he was engaged the whole time. But he's firing a shot now and then at the extreme limit of range, and maybe some are hitting, and most aren't. And so in the meantime, the Queen Charlotte sees that the Niagara's too far away for her to hit. So she closes up with the Detroit to support her commander. Uh, and so the, the Queen Charlotte and the Detroit, between the two of them, now have quite a bit of firepower over the Lawrence. And so even though Perry has a stronger squadron, even though he has more firepower, his distribution is such that he's put himself, he's jumped in very, uh, you could say almost rashly, into the front of this action. And he's, and his commander, his second in command, did not support him. And so now he's in a position where he is facing the firepower of local firepower of two, of two vessels combined. And the Lawrence is turning into a slaughterhouse because it's getting... Um, just a shat it's turning into a shattered wreck. And the men are just getting wiped out through splinter damage, through dismemberment. Um, a naval battle like this at ranges of 100 to 200 yards 
this is can't miss range. This is like here the far wall of the building. And you've got tightly packed masses of men in a wooden structure, can't miss range. Uh, you're going to have a pretty high butcher bill. And what's amazing about this story is the courage of the Lawrence's crew. Most of the time in these Napoleonic era naval battles, there's a, a rough set of statistics. If you look at the number of men engaged and the losses, battle after battle after battle, when you get somewhere in the upper 20s, low 30s, you get about a third of the crew bleeding from somewhere, and the rest of them give up. It's, it starts to look hopeless. Your rate of fire is going down. Your ability to, to, do, to deal with damage is going down. And somewhere along that, that casualties up to about a third, that would be where a crew would demand to strike their colors, to surrender. And it was not considered dishonorable to do so. Look, you tried hard, you did your best, you took a beating, and this isn't going well, and you know, pack it in before you, just everybody's dead. Well, on the Lawrence, that doesn't happen. On the Lawrence, they fight for two hours. They only had 103 listed as effective in the crew that morning with a sick list. Now, we don't know how many of the sick were even on board. Some of the, the really sick were kept ashore, put in bay in tents. But some of the sick were on board, and they might have dragged themselves up to help. So out of 103, out of 135 in the crew list, there's maybe, maybe 115, 120 fought that day. Well, at the end of two hours, there's 61 dead, or 61 wounded, and 22 dead and 61 wounded. That's 83 out of 100 and small change. That's a whopping casualty list. That's over 70%. And this crew was not packed it in. They're still standing by their commander. But then Perry is out of options because he's got almost no wind to move. His rigging is shot to pieces. The masts haven't fallen over simply because there's so little rock and roll motion. There's nothing to make him fall over. The masts are splintered. All the rigging is cut away. There's 200 splinter holes in the, in the spanker sail. Um, his last gun on the starboard side gets knocked out of action at 2.30 in the afternoon. He has nothing he can fight with. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? He doesn't have to think about a law. Because he's phenomenally lucky. Brave. Yes, incredibly brave, but lucky. Because the wind comes back from the southeast. And this, this breeze comes rushing in and builds stronger than it was before, blows the smoke away, and the British ships start moving with the breeze. The Lawrence is so badly damaged, she responds to it less, and so in relative terms, she's dropping back. The rain starts opening out. Everybody's just trying to catch her breath and figure out what's going on. There's been very little visibility for a while because of powder smoke and, and this dense atmospheres. Uh, it's been pretty hard to see for a bit. And then, just then, Perry looks around and he sees the Niagara sailing past. Now, he doesn't know what Elliot's going to do next. He knows he's been useless so far. And so he determines to transfer. Now he's again lucky here, because he still has a boat that's usable. Other ships, their boats were so shot up, they, couldn't, they had no boats afterwards. But he's still got a boat that, even though it's got a hole in it, is still usable. Been towing alongside on the outboard side. And so he jumps in with four men. They roll like hell to get over to the Niagara, because the Niagara's carrying, setting more sail. She's moving quickly, and these people have to roll like hell to catch up. They also roll like hell because the British figure out what's going on. They shift fire to the boat. Everybody in the boat is, is drenched with a splash of nearby misses. But Perry makes it over. Now, if he didn't make it over, think for a second, what's his place in history? Brash, young commander, impetuously jumps in ahead of the rest of his squadron, gets his men slaughtered, panics, flees his ship to save his own skin, and dies in disgrace, fleeing the scene in a small boat trying to save himself. That's what it looked like. But it doesn't work out that way. Because he arrives at the Niagara, he gets on board. We don't know exactly what gets said between him and Elliot. But at any rate, Elliot volunteers to go bring up the lagging gunboats. Absolutely superfluous errand, because the southeast wind would have reached them first. It would have moved them along, and they're already closing up, and they're already in range. But I think Elliot just doesn't want to be on the same deck with Perry in this embarrassing situation. 
So Elliot goes off on the boat and Perry then orders another downwind right turn. But this time it's with a ship that is almost undamaged. Again, ships that are very, very badly damaged. He sails across the British line, right across their bow, and just pours a double shot of broadside down their deck. It's uh, a bag of grape on top of a ball. And so in the space of about maybe six, eight seconds, over 600 pounds of hot metal go roaring down their deck. And at this time, the Queen Charlotte and the Detroit have the catastrophe of having a collision. The Detroit sees an aggro coming, wants to turn away, and both ships are so badly damaged aloft in the rigging, they're not very maneuverable. And the Queen Charlotte ends up running up and, and running her bowsprit into the Detroit's rigging on the mizzen mast, and they're locked. So they can't maneuver, they're both helpless, they're both raked by the same broadside. And Perry then rounds up, puts the sails back to stop the ship, pours in one more broadside, but then they've packed it in. They decide this is hopeless. They're surrounded with ships, the other gunboats have come up, they're getting hit from them, and then they surrender. So the Battle of Lake Erie is over in about 15 minutes after Perry transfers, after three hours. Perry's victory is lauded throughout the American states. Uh, how do you think this battle should be remembered? Well, it is, it is a great victory. It's a very dramatic story of, um, of Perry um, you know, building a squadron under some adverse circumstances. He was not, um, it's not a David and Goliath story, though. We did have the advantage of the day. And he just chose the way he handled the battle was maybe not exactly brilliant, and the way Elliot supported him was, I think, treasonous, or to be that insubordinate. So it it didn't it didn't end it didn't begin very well for us. And and fighting the British squadron, which with the advantages Perry had, he almost managed to, uh, as uh, I think Teddy Roosevelt said, managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. But in point of fact. The, the fight on the Lawrence is what, what kind of made this battle such a heroic story. The fact that that crew endured to the very end, such a fantastic casualty rate and stayed in the fight. And then the fact the victory was so total, you captured every single ship. So really the motto that he took for the Lawrence was the dying words of James Lawrence when his ship, the Chesapeake was being surrendered by his crew of the British. He said, don't give up the ship. He himself was mortally wounded. That was the only thing we could salvage from that, that defeat was the courage of the commander and his exhortation, don't give up the ship. So Perry takes that as motto flag. Well, the only way to give up the, you know, the only way to win the battle is give up the ship, go to the next one. But the real motto is, don't give up. And that's what carries from this battle. And that's why he won. And uh, it was a dogged determination that um, let him take advantage of every break, which he had plenty, but he needed them all. <laughs> With that, I'd like to thank Walter Ribka for joining us today. As always, if you have questions about today's episode or recommendations for future episodes of Battlefield Pennsylvania, please visit our website at PCNTV.com. On behalf of everyone here at Battlefield Pennsylvania, I'm Brady Kreitzer saying so long.